We will uh, have questions and answers. Um, I would invite the uh, students, if, if any of you have questions, for you to come up first. And I would ask um, everybody to be respectful of, of the students and, and let them ask their questions first. And um, so do you have, you guys have any questions? Come on, I know you're just dying to ask I have four questions. medical students in my office who um, love seeing the model. So if you guys have any questions, um, they love having more time with the patients, and I actually have paper charts. I show them what paper charts used to look like. They get a kick out of that. <laughs> All right. Thanks, you guys, for being such pioneers and joyful people. <laughs> Phil, I got a question for you, a couple, two questions. One is, is there a list of which states will allow you as a physician to dispense meds on, on the, DPC, the, the frontier? I've got a slide on that. I could, I could link it up and post it there easy okay. enough. Okay, that would be there great. Would be, that would be great. There, there are individual states' pages. And under each state page, I do have them discussed in detail there. Okay, great. Yeah. And then the other thing that I ran into recently is um, the, with, I, I'm really concerned, concerned about what's happening with our ability to prescribe, and particularly with what's going on between pharmacies and the, and the pharmacy benefits and the death of, of independent pharmacists and so forth. But um, I ran into a place where I don't have an NPI, or I didn't. And initially, it would be if I, if I had a prescription and a patient went into a pharmacy, they could pay for cash. I ran into a case this past year where in, in Tennessee, so uh, I, I wrote it, CVS, I'm, I'm in California, but the, where the patient was trying to get it filled in Tennessee said, no, the, the pharmacy, CVS pharmacy would not fill it without an NPI, even if the patient was paying cash. So it, it was completely blocking me from being able to prescribe unless I went and signed up for this NPI thing, mm -hmm. which I did, just to be able to take care. But it's just, you know, it's getting harder and harder to escape. So I'm just wondering if you've run into that problem before. Yeah, I mean, you can, pharmacists have discretion when they will or won't uh, fill a prescription. And especially if it's out of state and they can't find an NPI, then they're probably thinking the whole thing smells like fraud to them. And, and that's why they're doing that. Unfortunately, they've come to rely on that number as a, as a way to have security. I mean, but the truth is it's not secure. I mean, in, anybody in this room, you could type in their name and find their MPI in two seconds. Well, what's so interesting is in, in California, I could still do that, and this is with CVS. So I'm in the CVS system, uh -huh. right? You know, with, with all the other numbers, that the license and DEA, but, yeah. but it was just CVS in Tennessee, so it seemed to be a state thing. I, you know, maybe it's individual. I don't know. Yeah, I think the individual pharmacists have that kind of discretion, and uh, when they're working for a large, large chain like that, they probably don't care too much either. No. Mm -mm. Um, I have just a pragmatic question, and maybe if I could ask each of the panelists just to briefly respond. How are you handling? in a direct pay practice pre-auth um, obligations, both for expensive drugs and for expensive imaging that you yourself are ordering for a cash pay patient. As someone mentioned, yeah, the surgeon that, um, you know, when we write these, they're not our MRIs, but the MRI center is not doing the pre, you know, I don't know how that happened, but, that's a very ex that's an expensive overhead that administrative staff. So how I was just curious how you're each handling pre auth issues for cash pay patients. I'll take that question uh, because in our business, you know, we had to do a lot of prior authing for any procedures. So what I did is I found MRI scanners that don't make me do prior auths, and we have a smart choice up there, six hundred bucks. They've been six hundred dollars for their MRIs for the last fifteen years. They haven't raised their price, and they take anybody. And my patients have to drive an hour to get, or two hours to get the MRI. But the cost of driving is way cheaper than going to the local hospital, which is thirty-five hundred bucks plus a six hundred dollar radiology reading fee. So is that center pre-authing your 
They'll do it. Yep, they do it their own. And I just say I'm not going to do it. Now, once in a while I try to help people out, and I do do it occasionally, so it's never say never. But uh, I've cut a lot of that out and say, look, I, I'm not in your insurance. And one of the things is get rid of insurance, and I'm down to two now. And um, I just say, that's your insurance. Here's the information. And you know what? They do it. People do it on their own. And when the insurance, when they call the insurances, they get it done. It really works. We need to stop sucking that up. We just, they did it because we're stupid. And we did it. We're not business people again. And just say no. I think uh, the APS had an article on just say no. I'm telling you, the power of no is still the freedom in our country. I do the exact same thing he does. I have a um, private radiology place that I use, and it's $400 for an MRI of the lumbar spine, and I love the radiologist. So if they have insurance, usually it's going to cost them the same amount with a deductible and more missed work and an x-ray first and everything else. So, And they drive an hour there and an hour back, but it's usually really worth it. So I do the same exact same thing. In the state of Missouri, we have a physician who um, actually will bill the insurance company if they have to. He has to do any kind of PAs, and he has found that his uh, request for PAs has really dropped off after doing that. Yeah, he, he spoke at a prior AAPS event. His name's Greg Zydiak, and it's, it's worth watching. It's a great talk. Uh, really quickly, in my practice. Um, we, my imaging center will pre-auth for us if patients want to put their um, imaging through insurance, if they've hit their deductible or they have a good plan with um, a low deductible. Um, we will do an occasional pre-auth for some of our elderly patients just to help them out. Um, but uh, mostly, um, we have had a few patients say they'll do their pre-auths on their own and they actually like fighting with the insurance company, so we let them do that. Uh, pretty much more of the same. Uh, our normal MRI price is about uh, $400, CTs under $200, uh, ultrasounds about $100, X-rays about $40. Um, and, but uh, Lee Gross, uh, Dr. Lee Gross, a powerhouse in direct care, has always held it over my head that he could get MRIs for $250 uh, in Florida. And so because we have so many DPC docs in Wichita, one was able to get um, down to 259. So uh, I'm closing in on Lee. Uh, but you, the, the patient's copay through insurance is more than our cash price. So I'll let them jump through the hoops. If you want your insurance to pay for it, go for it. Here's the information. Otherwise, here's our cash price. Doing wholesale meds eliminates 95% of prior offs for meds. And then when they you get one, it's because they're more likely to need it, so you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do what the patients need. What's interesting, though, is people are becoming consumers of health care, and the people who are self-selecting, well, I'm finding in my area for DPC, they, they have a little fire in their belly, and uh, they're sick of, of being you know, run over the railroad tracks by their insurance company, so they're getting creative, and they don't mind um, stepping outside the box. I have a lot of people choosing not to pay for, uh, for testing, imaging labs, uh, imaging or labs and even medications if they have high deductibles. They're completely avoiding their deductibles and paying cash. The money they're saving they're putting aside for their high deductibles. I have a family with a $30,000 deductible. So they'd rather just pay cash and, and they're saving money actually doing that. So we're avoiding the Prios then too. Thank each one of you for being the first people to bail out of the aircraft. No one wants to be that first one. I'm right behind you, and thank you for being the first one out. But as I contemplate my jump, how do I protect my patients? What I foresee is uh, the hospital, the insurance, knowing they're my weak point, threatening them, sending them letters, um, fining or penalizing their HSAs. Do you foresee anything that could happen to my very sweet and trusting patients that I could head off at the pass? The one time I really saw um, Blue Cross kick back at a doctor and, and probably stop his practice was when he was trying to run an insurance-based practice and a direct care practice, which we, we recommend against. And he tried to say if he built a wall in between and, and separate entrances, it'd be different practices. And, and I think understandably Blue Cross said, nope, we have a contract you, with you that says you'll do X, Y, Z for Blue Cross patients. You can't, on the other side of the wall, do something different. 
other than that, I think if you cut the ties, it's, it's a clear separation. They can't penalize the patient's HSA. Um, they might say, well, we're not going to cover referrals. Great, I'm referring less, you know. And that's, you did that. And please put that in writing, because I'm going to share that with all of my patients, that your insurance said that they're not going to cover referrals, and they're going to make it. So I, I think often, when done right, they don't have a whole lot of ground to stand on to, to be very public and vocal about how they penalize patients. That's a, a losing proposition. Having been a recent convert, three years, and having 2,500 patients in my practice, 1,200 active, and being told by the president of the hospital that I was swimming upstream without a paddle three years ago, um, I was, you know, I, I, I was afraid that, you know, Highmark and Capital, who have been watching, I testified in Harrisburg um, with two other doctors from DP, uh, from Pennsylvania and um, Jay Keyes from DPC Coalition. We have a very unfriendly insurance commissioner. And, you know, in the back of our heads, we talked about this. Capital and Highmark who say they're not going to honor referrals from doctors that aren't participating. It hasn't happened yet. And if they did that, um, I, we'd probably band together and create a lot of noise about it. Um, not to say that it couldn't happen, but it is a fear and a fear I thought of as well, but no, there hasn't been any, any kind of pushback. In fact, you, we're probably saving the insurance company some money. Um, there are cash pay options out there too for specialists. It's amazing in my area, having been there for so long, once I started making phone calls, even to hospital owned practices, there are cash prices out there. They just don't, a lot of them just don't advertise them. So people will even avoid their deductibles and their insurance. Um, and do cash price, I can get a stress tax, an ex exercise stress test for $75. They don't even want to put it through their insurance, so then you're not even dealing with that. But. There's also the, the, the situation that they just really don't know what to do with us. Uh, when I was testifying at the uh, Missouri State House for our DPC bill, the insurance lobbyists were all kind of, they're, they're, they were standing behind by the wall and they, 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 they were looking at us like, well, where are these? They didn't. They didn't have anything they could say. They couldn't really because they didn't know. I uh, one time we had. Um, I overheard my nurse talking with with an insurance company on the phone, and she told me the rest of the conversation. Uh, the 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 gal from the insurance company was calling for records on the patient, and my nurse rightly said, "Well, we need to have a written release from the patient to to give you any records." And they said, no, we don't. no, you don't. We're their insurance company. And my nurse said, well, we don't bill insurance. And the lady didn't know what to say. She said, well, that's not good. That's not good at all. <laughs> and my nurse says, we think it's very good. Now, once you have the permission from the patient, then we can talk to you. Um, in our experience, working with, like uh, Phil mentioned, Allied National Smaller Insurance Company, TPA, um, we bring them business. We go to small businesses. We tell them, here's how you could work with an insurance company to carve out all the things that direct primary care does well to decrease your insurance premiums by 30 to 60 percent. Mm -hmm. So those insurance companies are, are happy to work because they've told us their profit margins are four times higher working with direct care docs than with standard insurance because we eliminate so much waste and expense. But then we were invited to speak this summer at the National Association of Healthcare Underwriters Conference in Kansas City, and 70% of the brokers there were familiar and supportive of direct care models. Brokers are out there taking all the bullets, saying, you know, my, my book of business, my small businesses are saying, insurance can't go up again 30%, find me a solution, um, and, and there's not. So they're looking at DPC as, as some sort of um, break in the dam that would help them as well. On the small business front, and actually I have to talk to Phil and Lee after this, um, uh, there's a DPC in Chicago who was con uh, contacted, uh, the president expanded the short-term limited duration plan rule. Um, she was just contacted by a broker who writes the uh, SDLIs and he wants to work with her um, and to market DPC with those new plans. So, you know, as changes are happening in Washington, uh, the administration is taking steps, uh, the association health plans, obviously you got to have a friendly state, which we don't have. Our broker, our, our insurance commissioner already said she's blocking both. Um, but that's going to actually open up the market for DPC and it's going to save employers and individuals a lot of money. Okay. Uh, Georgie Sayu from uh, Philadelphia area. Uh, I, I haven't jumped out of the plane and not can't seriously consider that at the moment, 
But I do have a situation where uh, I, I don't participate in the Medicaid uh, the, uh, insurances and those patients of mine who were previously on, on, on other plans and then became Medicaid due to whatever circumstances in their life, I take care of them for free. I don't bill uh, Medicaid. But I still have to do prior authorizations. So the two questions. One is um, uh, the fact that the prior uh, was partially answered before on, on the MRIs and so forth, but on the expensive medications, which you can't buy wholesale, I mean, for things like the GLP-1 uh, agonists uh, for diabetes and Humira for rheumatoid arthritis, uh, you still, somebody has to do a prior authorization uh, or otherwise they don't get the medication. So uh, how do you handle those things and, and do you have to do that? And the, the second thing is the, uh, what I've been getting, trying to do prior authorizations on those Medicaid patients where uh, I am not participating uh, usually they will have uh, been assigned to some other physician, which they're not seeing because they're seeing me. Uh, I, I'm beginning to get this pushback. Well, I can't, I can't do the prior authorization because I'm not there. Uh, I'm not in their system. So it has to be a doctor that's uh, in their system and so forth. So they're trying to force me this way to, to join their system, which is not worth it because you're know, getting reimbursed. You know, I don't know, twelve dollars for a visit. There's, it's not worth the paperwork that it takes to to get in there, but how would you handle these uh, you know, difficult situations with expensive medications? If it's a name brand medication, I'd go to a resource like needymeds.org um, or maybe directly to some of the pharmaceutical manufacturers because you can actually get them for free a lot of times based on the patient's income level. And oftentimes the income limitations there are higher than what they are to qualify for Medicaid. You get lots of samples, sometimes you can get samples. Yeah, oh, well, we do get samples, but it's... You know, and the other thing I, I would I would say one more time, just so everybody doesn't miss it, that that presentation Greg Zydiak did was excellent. You know, the the he's 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 perfected that process so well that he doesn't get these requests anymore. Every time he gets a prior auth, he smacks his cover sheet on it, set, where he offers to do it if they'll pay him forty two dollars, forty one dollars, and then slaps a legal case on there, and he has a fax war with them like four or five times, and then they give up and approve it, and now he doesn't get them anymore. Because they know he's just gonna, he's he's gonna get in that war and he's gonna win it. The other thing in Pennsylvania, we have ordering, referring, prescribing status. Um, did you know with me, I I didn't take Medicaid in my old insurance-based practice, but I did apply for an ORP status with Medicaid when I opened DPC. So I can still and it goes for Medicare too. Ordering, referring, prescribing. I'm not billing Medicare or Medicaid, but I can order, refer, or prescribe to those patients. Yeah, and, and there's a website online. Um, if you go to the PA um, PA website, you can do that, and that won't that'll help. Thank okay. you very much. You're can I make one comment on the expensive meds? That's what I was asking you to just as a follow up because I deal. I'm a rheumatologist, so I don't know five, ten times a day from Walgreens and the CVS about Humira. You know, all of them. So what we landed up doing after almost 15 years, a few of us is. Um, finding a pharmacist, what has happened is the pharmacies are now competing for your scripts. Those exp they make, that's where their margins are on those expensive drugs. They want my scripts. So the deal is that they do the work. Um, if they're able to fill it, then they get the script. If their insurance does not allow them to fill it, you know, because often they can, the patients just don't understand that they do the work of sending on all the proper information to the pharmacy that can fill it for the patient. And that's the deal that they have to do that. And then as a physician, I'm just upfront with the patient, look, I'm no longer dealing with 20 different mailaways and pre -offs. I go through this one person and then he services you depending on. So we had run that through our risk management and was told that was okay. Um, I don't know. If you feel that's different when you're a direct pay um, or what have it, but that is one way we handled the pre-auth, and it probably is offloaded, maybe half of the problems or half of the work for the nurses and for me. Hope that Phil agrees with me here in the sense of I just wouldn't sign a contract to any specific rules on that in the sense of I think that could be viewed as a kickback. Something we avoid with the imaging centers is I'm not going to send you 10 Remicade cases a month in exchange for the discount. 
Um, we just, whatever it is, I'll send, but if the patient doesn't want it, they don't have to. I could use a different pharmacist if I want so that there's not, we're not forcing people into specific. Yeah, it's, it's not a contractual required, you know, forced thing. I think you'll be a lot clearer. Tom Kendall, Family Practice, Greenville, South Carolina. DPC, primarily ambulatory care, Omnio Pro Agrado, all for the patient, everything for the patient. Uh, how many of your patients or what percentage of your patients are insured? In other words, they have something behind them other than the $50 a month or something, you know, whatever. And for example, you've got a two-year-old comes to see you. It looks like that two-year-old has meningitis. They don't have insurance. What is their, how do you handle that sort of thing? Um, my uninsured patients, uh, St. Luke's Health Network, so Lehigh Valley has, um, the Lehigh Valley proper, has Lehigh Valley Health Network and St. Luke's Health Network. St. Luke's Health Network, I think, is one of the first hospitals in the country to have something called St. Luke's Price Checker online, and they actually post cash prices. So I will send them there because they, I will tell them they, they can get cash prices for even emergency room visits and they're, um, you know, they can, they can do some cash pricing. They can use high tech too, yep. So um, that's what I do with my uninsured patients. If it's nothing as serious as meningitis that requires an os a hospital visit and possible admission, um, I have, you know, over three years I've compiled quite a list of of services that I know um, can have affordable cash prices. And sometimes it just takes making a phone call and asking. And sometimes the office will say, wow, we never thought of that. Let us get back to you. We're gonna come up with a cash uh, menu. And um, the offices love it, even even the ones that are owned by the hospital. It's less administrative work for them, just, you know, cash up front, so. Anybody else want to add? On a um, kid with meningitis, like, I just send them to the emergency room. Like, something like that, that's just gonna go and they can work out the pricing later. What we found is that a lot of our cash um, payers, usually the hospitals like to write those off. You know, they do get money reimbursement for non-paying. And if they don't, that a lot of times the patients can work with the hospital and get a much reduced rate later. But that kind of thing, I don't mess around with that, just goes straight in. It's one of those things that I would respectfully say is not a direct primary care question in the sense of we do the same thing that any physician would do for a patient that doesn't have insurance. And we would do the same thing for any patient that does have insurance. If, if you like ortho A, but insurance requires ortho B, you're following the insurance's rules because that's who's gonna pay. So, you know, you, you do what the patient's payer is gonna be able to do. If you take insurance or don't take insurance and you have a patient who is uninsured, you, you still do the best that you can for them with the resources that are available in your community. Um, it, it's not dependent on the business model, it's really dependent on the patient situation. So then you've, you know, um, if, if they need the ER, you, you go to the ER. That's, that's just it, you provide the same base level of care. I think the difference is we have more time, more resources to do more things. You might be uninsured and need a lot of labs that we get so much cheaper, or we might be able to get your Remicade for $1,100 wholesale instead of the 20000 that it is at the insurance. Um, but uh, but it's, it's really not specific a DPC question, it's a, a medicine question in, in a good way. I think that brings up a good point that we, um, I think Phil kind of touched on this. Um, we, we've all experienced this in this model. People come in and their expectations may exceed what your training and what your guardrails are. And in my contract and when I sit down and sign a patient up, I tell them I am practicing within the scope of my training and there may be situations where you require a referral, ER visit, hospitalization. I'm not a cowboy or a cowgirl. I'm not gonna do anything outside of my training because there are people who are coming in who are so beat up by the system, don't wanna, don't wanna go, you know, want you to treat everything from A to Z. I had a, I actually didn't sign up this gentleman. He, he and his wife came in and he had, melano he had had multiple melanomas. He's like, well, I want you taking off my melanomas and, and not my dermatologist. Now, some of the younger doctors <coughs> Uh, the, or coming out of residency doing some melanoma. I'm, I've been out of training for 25 years. I wasn't taught how to take off melanomas. I said, sorry, I don't do that. You're gonna still need to see your dermatologist. And so that was the only reason they were coming to my office was for that. That's not a good fit. So um, it is important to know that we are not, you know, we're not 
we're doing a lot more that we're trained to do as primary care because we have more time. We're not as dumbed down as, I'm not as dumbed down as I was in the system when I only had 10 minutes and my skills were getting soft because I didn't have time. Um, so I am practicing the way I was trained 25 years ago and doing the things I was trained to do. Um, whereas I was finding myself doing less of that and more referring in the old system. And it was dumbing down my skills. And that's an issue with primary care. DPC is helping primary care doctors be primary care doctors. But we have to make sure the patients know we're practicing in the scope of our training. And I think it's also important to remember that uh, your colleagues, that they need to all know who you are, what you do, and so that when you do have that two-year-old, you can call the pediatrician that you know, uh, that way they can actually save even the ER f visit if they have no money. Okay, let me see. I'm pretty sure this kid's got uh, meningitis. Would you, would, you, would you put them in the hospital? Heck yeah. We have five minutes, so um, let's go on it, with. I really admire you that you are coping with this vicious system and you successfully. Because in New Hampshire, uh, those who they are accepting any insurances, they are requested every month to uh, sending to, to different insurances a, a copy of uh, patients' records. Sometimes my, my colleague told me that it's up to sometimes 10, 10 uh, charts per day. Uh, per month, but of course he has uh, five secretaries to do it. Now, I, for instance, was not taking any insurances since 19, uh, it was in, since uh, 2014. Uh, Medicare pay, did not pay me until it, is, it owes me for $1,600 and I never would collect because they were ignoring my a, a paper a claim forms. They are supposed to do it on the electronics. And they, and of course, I was never requested, especially because I was not participating in, in any insurances, therefore I was not requested to send them any, uh, any records. But this, it is a purpose of this to checking if the doctor in private practice following guidelines. You know, because therefore he is in private practice, this is my colleague, but he has to follow the guidelines and all of them also they are the same things, you see. Therefore this is what, they are in private practice but they are really this this effect affecting this, their clinical judgment and clinical uh, management. Well, I, I had a private practice for 46 years in, in New Hampshire for uh, 28 years and I did not survive the system because they were, I was practicing clinical medicine, not electronic, and, they, and therefore, you know, I was victimized by the system. But some of them who they survive, they have to comply with the system and to follow the guidelines. But uh, I'm, I'm surprised that you are all coping so far, but probably it depends on the, on, uh, on the state. Thank you. I, I wanted to add real quick how I train my patients. Hospitals really hate me, first of all, because I don't use their MRIs which is their, you know, their huge money maker. But, so my patients have to go to the hospital and I tell them, you know, when you sign that form and the hospital says, you're gonna accept full payment, I say, cross it out and say, you guys take Medicare here? And they all say yes. I said, then I only pay at Medicare wages or rates. And, and, and the, the year guys, they don't care because their salaries aren't dependent on it. So they're all going in there and say, I take only Medicare, I only pay at Medicare. And they have to take them. And uh, now insurance contracts and that can get around that, but it, maybe Philly can add to that one, but I think it's kind of cool. It's kind of fun to watch them go in there and say, nah, we're gonna take Medicare. Hi, I'm Gwen Simons. I'm a physical therapist and an attorney, and I uh, represent PTs in independent practice who are struggling to stay in business. 
and having to go out of network due to low reimbursement. Um, I also see a DPC myself, and um, uh, last year we uh, actually got together on a bill that you all might be interested in. In Maine, um, we passed a right to shop bill. The DPC that I go to was having trouble getting um, insurance plans, because a lot of his patients still had insurance, uh, getting the plans to cover for services he would refer for. So the service would be a cover benefit, but because he was out of network, they would not recognize his referral. Um, so we passed what's called a right to shop bill. I think we're the first state in the country to pass it. Um, and as part of that bill, we put in a prohibition against any discrimination of out of network providers who refer. So if the service is covered, they have to cover it even though an out of network work physician refers for it. Um, the second part of that bill, which my PT clients were interested in, is um, if a consumer wants to go to an out-of-network provider for shoppable outpatient services um, and the out-of-network out providers charges are the same or less than the average of what the insurer would have paid their in-network providers the insurer has to cover that service and they can't punish the patient for it. So no more out, uh, separate out of network deductibles, no more higher co-pays or, or separate um, higher co-insurance payments. Um, so it levels the playing field for those of us who are in independent practice and have to go out of network due to low reimbursement, even though the hospital is getting paid three times more for the same service. Is your State legislature uh, bipartisan? I mean, it passed both houses? It pa well, yes, interestingly. Well, we have a Republican governor able to get bipartisan work on the committee. Um, and I, I mean, it, it was a, a bill of interest to our employers and consumers. We had great testimony on the whole medica medical um, loss ratio rule and how the insurers and hospitals are getting together and, and driving yeah. up the rates um, in hospitals. How long did it take you to get it passed? Um, it actually was a work in progress because it was introduced three years ago, didn't pass. They put a committee okay. together to work on it, and then it, it took we, a couple we, of years. I, I mean, Phil can comment on this, but I think we might need to see more of that happening um, or needing more of that. Yeah. So it, has it been litigated yet? No. I've got to think they're going to do that this minute they can, and it'd be interesting to see if it survives. Um, in, I, I, yeah, I'll send you a copy of the bill, and you can yeah. take a look at it. I don't know I'd what be happy litigation to see, would be raised. Uh, but. Um, two, two conversations I'd like to have you with you. One, just discussing that bill, and the second one would be um, whether or not there's any appetite among the physical therapist community to take a case to the Supreme Court about whether or not you guys should also be able to opt out of Medicare. Uh, since that's right now my you're not other allowed. passion. I'm yeah. working on that right now. I'm, I'll definitely talk to you about that. Yeah. We have time for one more. Phil, Phil knows my desire to go to the Supreme Court because my dad was there. So if ever there's a chance to piss off the IRS, I would invite a lawsuit. Um, real quick note on that. I think it was FGA, uh, right, um, right to shop, any willing providers type stuff. But Andy had a great story from years ago about un unjust enrichment in a cardiologist who, so I don't know if there's any play there where you know, the insurance company has a customer, the customer gets services, and the insurance company gets to skip out on the bill. Um, they've been unjustly enriched because their patient's healthier for free to them. Um, so there was a very interesting case there. And then we won that case, and that's the physician who won that case is sitting right there. Be back, watch you stand oh. up. As you can see, DBC, we like to, we like to put up our dukes a little yeah. bit. <laughs> well, I want to commend you for everything you're doing to try to bypass an evil system. <clears throat> it's extremely important that we do what you guys are doing. Uh, unfortunately, the people who are really running this system have different thoughts in mind. One of the things I want to commend you for, too, is for doing what's in the patient's best interest rather than doing more than uh, what you're capable of doing. But the reality of it is that all of our patients, sooner or later, they need to go to specialists, they need to go to hospitals, or they, at least they need to go to surgeries. They need, to, they need more than what uh, you can do. And in my area, unfortunately, we have very few remaining 
family doctors who are independent, uh, let alone DPC. But they're all owned virtually by hospitals. And one of them was telling me not too long ago that uh, the patients that sometimes had to go to the hospital, when they got out of the hospital, the hospitals took care of them, they were referred somewhere else to somebody in their hospital system. And so this, this is the final end result is what they want. They want a seamless set of physicians, specialists, and the ones who are feeding into the specialists to be owned by the hospitals. And the hospitals have been given all of the preferential treatment. In my area of Dayton, Ohio, just down the road, I cannot go to find a mammogram or find certain types of imaging centers that aren't owned by hospitals because the hospitals get the compensation. The laws are in their favor, and the reason they're in their favor is because the hospitals all contribute, each one of them, hundreds of thousands of dollars every year to the American Hospital Association, and they have millions of dollars that they lobby and they get whatever they want. They get differential price treatment. That, and we've got to stop the system because their ultimate goal of the government and the hospitals is to have a seamless system where the hospitals and the government are running everything. Well, I and think the administration has taken steps to create some competition that, as long as it continues the way it is, is going to force these hospitals to lower their prices. Insurers, I think, are going to start shopping for hospitals or, or uh, uh, medical uh, facilities that offer their services at a more reasonable price. My prediction um, is that hospitals are going to have to lower their prices and they're going to have to lower their overhead. Um, and I think they're going to start cutting practices loose, especially family practice, in the next five years. I would like to think you're right, but in my area, the hospital would not give us Medicare prices. Their prices started out at a huge, huge number, and they only came down. They came down some, but they, they don't come down to Medicare prices. But their hospitals are different in different places. I understand that. Mm -hmm. But the, the total goal here is to trap everybody into their own insurance systems and so what we have today in 2018, what you're doing is great, and I applaud it, and, I, and I, I hope it lasts, but that's not what they have in mind. And the Trump administration, unfortunately, is trying to limit what people can do with their own money, their own HSA money. And, uh, oh, I, yeah, I, we're all over that. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know you are, and I, and I applaud it, and I, and, but yet uh, I don't hold out a whole lot of hope for the Trump administration. I think it's going to have to be a sea change in the way medicine, and we have to have price control's gone. We have to have liberty back. We have to do away with all of these systems where patients are forced into certain government programs like I'm forced into Medicare. And I'm not, I'm not happy about it, but we have to liberate patients from being forced into this evil I system. Think, and and the I other think price transparency and, and, um, and options are the first step towards that. Um, people have a choice and, and the price transparency is there and they can, they're, they're starting to be consumers of care. But in Medicare, that's a different story. Thanks again for what you're doing. Thank you. Go ahead. Hello, John Moore, uh, Sarasota, Florida, the pediatric surgeon. Uh, lest we get confused about where we are with the finances of medicine, we've been beaten down as to thinking Medicare is the rate that we should accept and that should be reasonable. And so our students know where we are and what we're doing with this. In Sarasota, Florida, if you do a total hip, total knee, total shoulder, you get paid $1,200. And that includes three months of post-operative free care. If I get my breaks done on the way home from surgery, it costs me $1,200. So a total hip and a, uh, and a break job is the same thing. That's what society values our services as. They don't have any, obviously, any responsibility if my breaks go bad after, after a little bit, all that sort of thing. Just as a comparison's sake, in markets where there are total hips done without insurance, a total hip is $8,000 in, in Wisconsin, one of my friends who's there. So we're discounted by about one-eighth of what the market rate is at, at Medicare rates. So just in case anybody in this room is confused about how we should really be stewards of the public and we should actually be accepting Medicare rates, because that's a good payment rate, free market does not indicate Medicare rates. Medicare rates is a deep discount already. And as you clearly stated at, if you're not profitable, you can't take care of the public. You can't work in the red unless you're the US government. <laughs> okay, do we have any other questions? All right, well thank you so much to the panel and thank you for your attention.